Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today. Welcome to NARC's sixth webinar conference call on how regions can and are responding to the COVID-19 epidemic. This is Leslie Wallach. I'm Executive Director, National Association of Regional Councils. I'll serve as today's moderator. Once again, thank you for joining us. Um, next slide, please. Today, we're joined by two workforce experts who are here to help us better understand how unemployment insurance will change and how the workforce development system can help workers make their way through this very difficult time. Uh, next, please. Um, we are happy to be joined by Julie Spire, Policy Director for the National Association of State Workforce Agency, NASWA where she serves as the staff director for NASWA's Unemployment Insurance Committee. And we're also joined by Katie Spiker, Director of Government Relations with the National Skills Coalition. Uh, Katie serves, works to advance NC, NSC's Washington-based policy efforts through federal legislation, agency regulation, and national funding initiatives. Next, please. As we move into this uncharted territory, it's worth noting that the spread of COVID-19 in the US is really only just beginning. As this map shows, hotspots are emerging all over the country, including Detroit, Chicago, New Orleans, Miami, and Los Angeles. This morning in the US, nearly 187,000 people have been positively identified as having COVID-19 and nearly 3,900 have died, and surely that number has gone up considerably in just the last several hours. Yesterday, we heard the frightening news that between 100,000 and 240,000 individuals might die as a result of COVID-19. Next slide, please. Along with the numbers of cases, unemployment has skyrocketed. Last week, 3.3 million filed for unemployment, and this week it's possible that an additional 2.5 million will have filed. Just yesterday, the Federal Reserve in St. Louis said that in a worst case scenario, by, that by the summer, we could see co coronavirus job losses totaling 47 million with an unemployment, unemployment rate of 32%. Next slide, please. And then the norms, the rules for us keep changing. Self-isolation, physical distancing are becoming more and more common as 30 states covering 225 million people have adopted stay-at-home rules. Public and private spaces have been shut down. Restaurants, bars, gym, theater, and all the other venues have been ordered shut in addition to parks, beaches, and other public recreation facilities. At the same time that millions of Americans suddenly find themselves working remotely, millions more are finding themselves out of work with no possible way to find a new job. And the pain is not equally divided with low and lower middle income workers experiencing the most pain. According to some economists, we are only seeing the beginning of the collapse of the job market. Shifts in rules regarding the wearing of masks are also confusing and concerning America. Next, please. The goal of this webinar, like the webinars that NARC has been putting together for your information, is to provide you with information helping you better meet the needs of your member municipalities and counties and the organizations that you're in charge of. This webinar will focus on enhanced unemployment insurance and workforce development program assistance. We're lucky to have with us two experts who can better clarify how unemployment insurance and workforce development um, Workforce development have changed as a result of the CARES Act. Let me introduce our first presenter. I thank, thank her very much. Julie Spire, Policy Director at the National Association of Workforce Agency. And I'll turn everything over to you, Julie. Thank you. Thank you very much, Leslie. Hi, everyone. I have been with NASWA for over five years now. And our members are your state workforce agencies. And they handle not only unemployment insurance, but workforce programs, including uh, helping people find jobs, the one-stop centers, uh, veterans reemployment, labor market information programs, and technology systems. So prior to working 
uh, NASWA, I was with the Maryland Department of Labor and Workforce Development, and I was in UI and was the deputy director and the UI director during the Great Recession under Governor O'Malley. And for those of you who are around in workforce in the 2008-2009 period, we had a very similar but different uh, experience, actually drastically different. The UI challenges at the agency in handling call claims in the recession was that we had a very gradual increase. And I looked back, and when I was in Maryland in 2010, we had about 12,500 claims in one week. That was the highest number of weekly claims, 12,500. And you saw the chart that Leslie had with the really high increase. In Maryland, the week ended on March 21st, we had 41,000. I wouldn't be surprised to see that number jump up more. And I think that next figures are going to dwarf the 2009 and 2010 figures when all the self-employed individuals file as a result of the program, the Pandemic Employment Assistance, or PUA. I'm going to talk a little bit about what NASA is doing and uh, what our members are also doing under the CARES Act. And if you could go back a slide, I think I had a slide, maybe this one. Oh, maybe it didn't get in, but I'll just give you our website URL, www.naswa.org. And if you put the NASWA, go on the NASWA website, we have a box kind of on the front. It's labeled COVID. And in that box, we have some uh, resources, particularly information from the state on resources that they have developed and links to their website. And I think that you might find that really interesting in order to find out information about what's going on in your state for unemployment insurance. We also have in that section, in that uh, COVID-19 resource area, information on uh, the new laws that have been We have some summaries and some other information that you might find helpful. So. Uh, I would recommend just going to www.naswa.org, that, push that COVID box. And in that, uh, we also have more information for our members. And we've really been doing a lot of member-focused activities, uh, especially starting weekly conference calls with our state agencies. We um, have, I just wanted to uh, make sure everybody knows, because I know a lot, of, a lot of you on the call don't necessarily do a lot with unemployment insurance that regular unemployment insurance can vary from state to state. So in some states, you might have regular compensation of 12 weeks. The maximum amount in states are uh, 26 weeks. And the average weekly benefit amount can also range widely uh, from $213 a week. I think the, the most recent high, I haven't verified this, but last I remember it was $795 a week. So in addition to doing those weekly calls, we've been doing a lot of things to help our administrators, our UI staff. We have uh, dedicated email for them if they want to ask questions. We've had daily calls with the National Governors Association to share issues across organizations. We've also been sharing uh, promising practices, especially around the area of communications. This is really important. And if you're not on uh, Twitter or uh, you know, uh, if you want to find information about your state uh, or the states in your region, I would recommend looking at their website. Uh, a lot of uh, states are posting information right now. We have also been uh, partnering with USDOL to tackle various state agencies and questions. We have also been working with philanthropic organizations and vendors to find out assistance that uh, they may be able to provide to state workforce agencies. We're also uh, focusing on making sure that, you know, with, with new programs coming out, we need to make sure that benefits are paid appropriately. And we have an integrity center that focuses on making sure that unemployment insurance benefits are paid properly. So now I am going to talk a little bit about the new UI program after the CARES Act. And right now we're on section 
two, which uh, is um, going to be a big one. It's going to be a tough one for the states. This is pandemic unemployment assistance. And this, again, cannot emphasize this enough. This is a new program. This really is beyond normal unemployment insurance, which is in normal times there for someone who's lost a job as an employee through no fault of their own. And what we're doing new pandemic unemployment assistance, it's very similar in a way to those who are familiar with disaster unemployment compensation. So in the instance of a hurricane, a region or a part of a state that is impacted by the disaster, and individuals can get uh, assistance, compensation, including those who are self-employed as they get through that disaster. So the brand new pandemic unemployment assistance with the unfortunate acronym of PUA uh, is going to be statewide. So it's going to be for up to a maximum of 39 weeks and the claims will be able to be updated to January 27th. And this new program that is currently under the law to expire at the end of this year. This is 100% federally funded. And this is going to be the greatest challenge for state agencies for many reasons, primarily because uh, it's never been activated on a statewide. Some states have very sophisticated IT systems for this and will not have much of a challenge. Other states are going to be manual. And uh, this, this is definitely going to be the heavy lift. Uh, next slide. So this section, this is still the one. Two. Don't mind going to the next one. One more. Uh, next slide. We have to go one, one, four. There we go. Okay, so two, one, oh, four. One more. There we go. Okay, that's it. So this is an additional amount of compensation that will be added to everyone's payments. So the regular UI program, uh, an additional $600 is going to be added. For those of you who were around during the recession and paying attention to the details of unemployment insurance, you might remember a $25 Several additional compensation. We called that FAC, uh, another unfortunate acronym. The new payment is called Federal Pandemic Unemployment Compensation, or FPC. So this will add that additional $600. This is 100% federally funded, and states are working to make these payments starting this week. And next slide. Next program, yes, these are all different programs that the states are going to be implementing. This is Pandemic Emergency Unemployment Compensation, or PEUC. And this is similar to the Emergency Unemployment Compensation, or extended benefits uh, that were done during the recession. This provides an additional 13 week coverage, and it's for people who have exhausted their basic unemployment insurance. You'll remember during the Great Recession, we had different tiers and had kept on having an additional week. This is similar to that. Basically, an additional 13 weeks of benefits if someone is still unemployed. And this program is set to expire by the end of this year. Next slide, please. This is just some details about this amount. If you could go to the next slide. This is getting a little bit more detailed, but I think it's important to mention there's a program. It's called short-term compensation. Some states call it work share. This program is not in all states. I do have a link there where you can, um, and I'm assuming that this is going to be shared, but there's a link there where you can go and see what states have implemented this program called short-term compensation. This is a very popular model in Germany and some other European countries. 
where employer signs up for this with the consent of the employees, and it's a way of keeping your skilled workers. You reduce their hours, but you make up the difference with unemployment insurance. It's really a fantastic program, uh, and in the CARES Act, they have uh, allowed for 100% federal funding for these benefits that are normally paid for through the state. Um, and they've even said that you don't have a term compensation benefit, and you can manage to run one, but it's not currently in your state law. They will, the feds will uh, pay for 50% of that funding. So these are law changes that your agency leaders are aware of, um, and these are all the programs. Next slide, please. I just wanted to close some thoughts about how the state UI agencies are very stressed right now. All systems at the state agencies and call centers, claims adjudication, are going to be pushed to the limit with the sheer volume of claims that are hitting the states and I think it's just going to get worse over the next couple of weeks. The large volume increase uh, will be when the initial claims, which have just started to go into the system, that big jump up on the chart, chart that we showed earlier, that's going to transition to continued claims. And the state system will be processing millions of claims a week to make these. Everyone right now is focused on improving the throughput of claims through their various systems. So I think states are doing a good job of communicating. And again, I would encourage you, if you have any questions about what's going on in your state, to find those methods of communication in your state if you want to find out more. That instead of like calling somebody, um, for example, many state UI agencies are tweeting, have websites. You have also had virtual calls, and some states may use the process. I did want to make a, uh, another You might be getting questions from people who are worried about getting their payments. Please let them know that even if states are delayed and aren't instantly getting out these benefits, remember the ink just dried last Thursday night on this law, and states need to put in processes here. But the good news is that any there, there will be back there will be back so it obviously that doesn't get them cash right away or quicker but hopefully that will help if people know that uh, they will be able to get all their funds back dating and the good news is that the state workforce agencies are really working together and learning from each other and supporting each other and these the staff, workforce staff uh, both in the state and in the uh, workforce system in the one stops, they are like every other frontline worker and they are rising to the challenge here. And it's a really big one. I'm happy to, um, Leslie, I don't know if you want to take call questions at the end or how you want to do it, but I'll turn it back to you, Leslie. Great. Thank you so much, Julie. Why don't we wait until the end and we'll take um we'll take questions at the at the end. Um, that sounds great. Thank you. All right. Thanks again, Julie, for all that information. That's great. And all those um links you provided and resources and we will we are recording this um and we will make the slides available on our website but it could be up by tomorrow um so thank you again and now i'm going to turn to katie spiker government relations for the national Insurance coalition um and take it away um katie thank you so much thanks so much leslie um, so I will build on some of what, what Julie, Julie shared around what was in the third stimulus package as far as it relates to workforce. And then largely, because spoiler, there wasn't a ton on workforce in the third, um, spoiler, or excuse me, third stimulus package, um, look towards ways that we've been engaging with National Skills Coalitions networking with other national organizations, including NASA and NARC on building advocacy um, to ensure that, that workforce is a component of a fourth stimulus package. Um, so uh, I will start with a little bit of level setting that um, is probably, folks on the call are probably even more in touch with, um, but just to give, and this is some of what Julie described too when you look back to 2009, the context, um, but uh, thinking about the way that the workforce system, um, the public workforce system has the capacity to serve workers who 
um, ha have lost their jobs. So in, in a normal month, almost 2 million people are laid off or discharged from their jobs. Only about half that many file for unemployment insurance. Um, and far fewer, um, less than half of that number receive training for a public workforce system to help them find new good jobs. So even in the best of times when our system is fully, um, I won't say fully funded, but as funded as it can be, and when there's uh, relatively stable demand on it, the workforce system, um, uh, without additional investment, um, is poised to help address some of the challenges associated with COVID and its uh, economic impact, but will need additional resources to do so. So thinking about what Julie said uh, previously, the 3.3 million almost people filed last week for unemployment insurance. Um, and at the same time, our public workforce and post-secondary education systems are largely operating on remote or distance services. Um, meaning that workers right now don't have access to training for things like respiratory medicine, something that a, a nurse's assistant or nurse could rapidly uh, upskill for, or training for custodial workers at the scale necessary to ensure that they're not being overexposed to the virus. And so a lot of the work that National Skills and our National Partners have been doing is ensuring that we're raising up the message of the role that, that the workforce system has to play in both preparing workers to address the current needs in order to address the health uh, crisis that we're facing today, and ensuring that it is uh, ready to respond to the needs of workers who have lost their jobs and businesses who are in desperate need of workers once we are on the path to recovery. Um, so in the existing response to the crisis, we've seen minimal response that addresses workforce needs. Um, and that response has, has not included a comprehensive strategy to address the immediate source uh, shortage in, of workers and in industries that are needed to respond to the crisis or set us up for economic recovery afterwards. Um, but there have been, in addition to the UI component, several uh, key first steps in moving in that direction, from particularly in the third stimulus bill. So the, the third stimulus bill did include um, $345 million in grants for national dislocated workers um, uh, so that um, States and, and areas can apply for funding to help respond to the immediate needs for workers who have been who have lost their jobs. Um, just as for context, the the bill did not include any of the formula funding uh, to the workforce system that we saw under the American uh, Reinvestment and Recovery Act in 2009. Um, and in ARA, the, um, the the bill included 1.25 billion dollars for dislocated worker formula funds. Obviously, far dwarfing the the investment that we've seen so far, um, for for at, even with that 345 million dollars for national dislocated worker grants. Um, the third stimulus package also included access to 10 million dollars in grants for small businesses, and importantly, included nonprofits and the entities who are eligible to apply for that the, that 10 million dollar in grant fund. Um, the the grant funds are intended to co cover payroll and some expansion. Um, excuse me. Uh, to cover payroll and um, other administrative costs for businesses to help them stay open. Um, and businesses and nonprofits would be eligible to apply for forgiveness for those up to $10 million loans um, based on not laying off people. So as they maintain their payrolls, um, they'd be eligible for forgiveness for the uh, principal of those loans. There also was um, an investment of $3.5 billion in, the, uh, in Child Care Development Block Grants to ensure that um, for workers who are um, uh, working to respond to the COVID crisis, that they can still afford to be able to pay for child care costs. Um, and I think the, the messaging that we've really been focused on is that, that those efforts and investments are really critical, but as we look to the next negotiations that are happening around a forced stimulus package, um, the, the pandemic has made one thing crystal clear, that the, uh, the unsung heroes in our society are those who are working in the, the health and working, risking their health and safety to keep the country moving, like healthcare professionals, um, grocery store clerks who are working to stock shelves, electricians, mechanics, and HVAC technicians who are keeping our utilities up and running. And these are all industries um, that are, while they're critical to responding to the COVID uh, pandemic are also the same industries that have long faced worker shortages because investments have not been made in workers' ability to access training and support necessary to succeed in those jobs. Um, and that's led us now to the point where we don't have enough workers that are trained to build new ventilators, 
we don't have we have hospitals that are overwhelmed and burdened because there aren't enough healthcare workers and our first responders don't have enough support to meet the demand of the crisis um so to help address both those immediate and the longer term needs um national skill coalition along with a set of national partners including narc just sent up a letter today to house leadership and um, house appropriators calling for 15 billion dollars in workforce and skills training for uh, programs under the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act and career and technical education programs, as well as adult basic education programs. Um, and National Skills Coalition has been focused on the fact that this, this investment is, is critical to being able to ensure that workers have access to training, but Congress also needs to pull every lever uh, that they have in order to ensure that um, businesses are able to find workers today and workers can access those good jobs. So we recognize that access to training isn't enough. Um, we also have focused on how to respond to displacement and ensure that workers get the support they need in those training programs by calling for uh, a $10 billion universal dislocated worker fund that would ensure all workers, um, including contingent workers, can access income, healthcare, and retraining support services to help them get a new job. Um, some of the things that we think are really important as part of that are, are already available under trade adjustment assistance for workers, um, but are available to too few workers because workers uh, eligible for trade adjustment assistance for workers um, are those who are who lose their jobs because of the impact of foreign trade. Um, and so expanding that kind of support to, to all workers. Um, and, and finally, some of the layoff aversion strategies like short-term compensation that Julie discussed are really critical to National Skills Coalition's business partners to help them avert layoffs. Um, and, and our business partners have really been pushing to include not just um, loans, but including targeted tax credits so that they have support for upskilling incumbent workers to help them rapidly respond to workforce needs um, as the crisis progresses. Um, so, so what are we hearing from our partners? Um, so our partners, whether they're uh, folks that are, are running workforce programs or part of the, the public workforce system um, or community-based organizations or community and technical colleges is that programs are transitioning, transitioning to online services where it's possible. Um, many one-stop uh, centers are closed, but um, I'm sure folks on this the the call who are, are working really intimately with the workforce system uh recognize that the the one-step centers are, are not the only way in which the public workforce system is serving workers or businesses and so um both local and state uh workforce entities are rapidly responding to business demand for new workers and helping to empower businesses to be able to train those workers um uh on the job currently um, but there's still significant business needs. So our, many of our business partners at this point to their credit are adapting and doing the best they can to respond. Um, one of our, one of our partners, uh, is Wyoming Machine, a small metal, metal fabricator with less than 60 employees in Stacy, Minnesota. Um, they usually make 5,000, um, of these metal plates that are, are used in ventilators to help, um, help patients who have severe respiratory disease, uh, they usually make about 5,000 of them annually, but because of the demands of the current crisis, they're on track to make 10,000 before April. Uh, but a lot of what we've heard from, from them and other business partners is that the on-the-job training has been really difficult even to transition over to this new um, uptick in what they're manufacturing because they don't have enough workspaces for people to be able to work six feet apart and maintain the necessary social distancing. And on top of that, because they are a smaller company, have a lot of workers who have been with them for a long time. Many of their more senior uh, folks who are who are helping and move along the the production process um, have had to to stay at home because of the health risk because of the pandemic. So they're struggling both with space issues and with trying to get workers skilled up and and ready to go um, to to help them reach their goal of 10,000 of these plates. Um, I think uh, another thing that we've been hearing a lot from our folks that ties back with what um, Julie was talking about is that um, so many, about, about one third of the training referrals for the public workforce system come through the connections between the unemployment insurance system and the workforce system. And so maintaining, as we see the increases in those, um, in, work, in workers and individuals claiming unemployment insurance with the public workforce system is the way that we're gonna create the transition and the pipeline between workers who are claiming uninsur unemployment insurance 
and then transitioning back into in-demand jobs rapidly. Um, and as we look towards the um, uh, towards the economic recovery. Um, so we've been hearing that the uh, next round of a stimulus package that House Democrats are expected to release a draft bill um, for uh, what phase four will look like in the next week. Um, Senate Republicans seem to be a little bit uh, um, on a little bit of a longer timeline. Um, and so I think at this point, there's not even necessarily certainty that there will be a fourth stimulus package, although I guess I would be surprised if there isn't, but um, there certainly, at least in public comments, is not certainty the way that there was around the first three that something big needs to happen. Um, Speaker Pelosi has said that she wants to have uh, a deal um, negotiated when uh, both chambers are back April 20th, um, and the appropriate Senate Republican appropriators have indicated that they'd be interested in having those conversations. Um, but I think that there's still a lot of advocacy and um, an effort that needs to be put into ensuring that we have another stimulus package um, in the coming weeks, as opposed to waiting to see the impact of the crisis in the coming months, and that if we have that fourth package, um, that it includes workforce um, and that it includes things that, that help workers be able to transition back to good jobs and meet local business demand. One of the other places that even in the past 24 hours has started to get more attention within the conversations around the fourth stimulus package is the focus on investments in infrastructure. Um, the, the president tweeted that he wanted to see investments um, in infrastructure in a fourth stimulus package. And just this morning, House Democrat leadership um, had a press conference where, where they, um, they pointed to a almost $1 billion proposal that House Democrats released in January that would um, invest in infrastructure. Um, as an leader, House Democratic leadership, point, leadership pointed to that as a model for what they would hope to include in any fourth stimulus package. One of the things that we've heard from many of our partners and that uh, our advocacy has focused on is that in order to um, in order to implement and, and actually run the projects that would be part of an infrastructure package, uh, local areas need need workers to be able to fill the jobs to do that to uh, run the pro the projects and programs. Um, according to the Georgetown Center on Employment um, on Education and the Workforce, a one trillion dollar investment in infrastructure. Would, would create 11 million new jobs for infrastructure industries, um, which are, are obviously industries that are already struggling to find existing workers. And so ensuring one of the other things that we've been hearing a lot from our network and that we've been pushing policymakers on is to ensure that an infrastructure, that there is a fourth stimulus package, that that fourth package includes workforce, and that it includes infrastructure, and that any infrastructure investment also includes the focus and investment in workers to be able to do the work and in supporting businesses to be able to be uh, engaged with and um, uh, training workers in order to meet their demand in those infrastructure industries. Um, so I think one of the, um, uh, one of the, the big messages and the things that we've been hearing a lot from our network just in, as, a, as a final thought is that all of our partners, whether they're community organizations, workforce folks, community or technical colleges, are rapidly responding to the crisis. Um, uh, our business partners are trying to shift the way that they're doing work, but still running into challenges and finding workers um, and accessing even existing federal dollars to help support them to do that. Our community and technical colleges are struggling with being able to continue learning, uh, especially in some of the really technical courses. Um, both because they're donating hospital beds and uh, student clinical hours to respond to the immediate health crisis, and because uh, the facilities are closed down and so workers aren't, uh, students aren't able to actually attend and do any of their learning in person. Um, our community-based organization partners are struggling to be able to uh, pay rent and maintain um, the, the payrolls of the workers that are critical to them being able to serve the participants that they serve and are concerned about the timeline for some of the small business and, and nonprofit loans that are, um, are, are trying to work together in order to um, address those challenges now. And then, uh, of course, the workforce system is trying to both rapidly respond to business need and um, address some of the challenges that workers are facing. Um, so happy to answer any um, detailed questions about, about any of that, but, uh, and really glad that 
Um, Nark, you all are, are both a partner in some of the national uh, advocacy work that, that we're doing and that folks on this, this call are interested um, and engaged in how workforce is, is part of one of the ways to address and respond to the current health crisis and its economic impact. Well, thank you, Katie. Thank you to both of you for being for such great up to the minute information and just sort of reporting on what happened this morning. Um, as Katie mentioned, uh, NARC was pleased to sign on to the letter drafted by the National Schools Coalition on behalf of the Campaign to Invest in America's Workforce, CIAW. Um, well, before we get to questions, I just want to make the following request to CIAW the campaign to invest in America's workforce would, is looking for your help in information on how you would use an influx of funding if in fact we were able to get funding through a fourth sim stimulus bill as um, Katie just mentioned and, and talked about uh, that effort. Uh, for example, would you spend it on upgrading your computer systems to allow for more online training? Would you use the funding for subsidized jobs or apprenticeships once businesses reopen? Any ideas would be greatly appreciated. As you know, the more good information we have to present to Congress, the better opportunities we have to have funding directed in a way that makes sense for you. Please send any information to Neil Bomber uh, at neil at n-e-i-l at narc, n-a-r-c dot o-r-g um, and um, this information and the webinar and all these requests, as I said, is going to be recorded and you'll be able to access it tomorrow. Now I'd like to open the webinar to any questions and answers you may have. Please enter your question in the question box on the right of your screen. And Eli Stang, um, NARC staff, another NARC staff member, is going to read and direct the questions to our presenters. So I will turn it over to Eli and once again thank our speakers for joining us and offering such great info. Thanks, Eli. All right, thanks, Leslie. Uh, as Leslie mentioned, please do just type all of your questions into the question box and we will get to them. Uh, we're gonna start off here uh, with the question, the qualifications for the pandemic extension state that the applicant slash recipient must be actively seeking work. How will that be determined when a particular state is under stay at home mandate? So is this a is this is for the pandemic unemployment insurance? If you look at the qualifications for the pandemic unemployment insurance, um, that it, somebody would be eligible if they're required to uh, be at home because of the mandate. I mean, I think that uh, you have to go through there are a number of eligibility requirements in there. Um, but someone who either has to uh, stay home and doesn't it can't go to work because of COVID-19, I think would be eligible. Now this person uh, can't, is not eligible if they have an option of working from home for their employer. Um, I hope that answers the question. Oh, I, I would also wanna add that we are expecting, hopefully as soon as this week, detailed guidance from the US Department of Labor that will help uh, fill out some of the questions that people have about the pandemic unemployment insurance. But in general, if someone is unable to work because of COVID-19, they will generally generally be eligible for the pandemic unemployment assistance. Uh, all right, we have a couple other questions that I'll actually be able to answer here. Um, uh, people were wondering if the if a copy of the presentation will be available following um, the webinar. I just wanted to say that uh, it will be and that we will email that out um, in the follow-up email to the webinar, um, which should go out uh, tomorrow. All right. I am, I am not seeing any more questions uh, pop up here, so I would encourage anyone who's on the line who has one. Um, to send it in now. Thank you. You know what? I'll break in just like as um, 
I think it was Julie who said there are, are a lot of questions and rules will be coming out shortly from the Department of Labor. Um, this was a big bill that came through last Thursday. It was just Thursday, Friday. All the days are running into each other, aren't they? Um, but was was just signed. And so you will have staff right now busy trying to interpret all this and information. We have a lot of information. Uh, Eli has done an amazing job in putting together all the resources we can find on our website at narc.org. So you can go back and find a lot of that information. We will post it as available. Um, information will be included through our uh, our newsletters that we put out twice a week. So I encourage you to go to our website and look for uh, information. And I see the slide is up with um, inf inf information for our from our presenters with information that uh, can help you as we go through this. Um, if Eli, I don't know if there are any other questions or it's time to wrap up. Um, I am not seeing any other questions, so I think you can go ahead and wrap up. Okay, well, I want to thank you, Eli, Katie, and Julie. Thank you for participating. Thank you to all of you for participating in, in this. It is, it is recorded, will be available tomorrow. For more information, please access NARC's web page on COVID-19 by going narc.org, coronavirus 2019, which includes a range of information you may find helpful. In addition, we provided you with the NASWA and National Skills Coalition web pages dealing with the virus. I would like to remind you that NARC will act as a repository for policies and practice statements developed by regions, municipalities, counties and states that you will be able to access through our dedicated web page. Please forward any documents that you have. Um, one of the things that we have found that uh, members are just anxious to share with each other. So please forward any documents that you might have and you wish to share with your colleagues to Jessica um, Rawson at jessica at narc.org. And let me now thank uh, all of you Katie and Julie for your excellent presentations and all the information. Thank everybody on the call for your questions and the discussion. Part of our efforts to address the COVID-19 pandemic in your regions, we will continue to host these webinars and conference calls over the next few weeks. Next week, we plan to host a webinar dealing with services to seniors at a time when congregate meals, senior centers, and other service have had to shut down, isolating many older Americans. Many of you are the host for your area agency on aging, and many of you offer senior programs anyway to your community. So we think you'll find that of value. Look, for, look to our website for more information on that schedule. Check our, our weekly newsletters, Transportation Thursdays, which comes out on Thursdays, and uh, eRegions, which comes out on Monday, plus our website for information. We'd also love to hear from you. What, what are your challenges, what you would like to know, and what other informational sessions that we might be able to hold to offer our services to you? Um, to be Also, to be aware of every webinar or conference call we are hosting, make sure to check your email for announces, announcements of future conference calls and webinars. If you need inf additional information about this webinar, please contact Neil, uh, same place you're sending your CIAW, um, information on how you would use future funding, please contact Neil, N-E-I-L, at narc.org, or me, Leslie, at narc.org, and we'll make sure your questions are answered, your information is posted on our web page. With that, I thank you very much. A big thank you to Katie, Julie, and all of you, and we look forward to speaking with you next time. Talk to you soon. Thanks very much, and stay happy, stay safe, and wash Thank you. Thanks so much. Bye bye. Oh, I hate talking.